Good afternoon and welcome to Wyden Woods, uh, where the Embassy of Japan, the Oxford Research Centre in the Humanities and the Oxford University Kilns, the director of which is Dr. Robin Wilson. Hello, Dr. Robin, how are you? Good morning, how are you? I'm very well, thanks. A bit better now. <laughs> Who knows what we're going to get when we open this kiln, because that's why we're here. Yeah. Um, we have been spending the last week firing a Japanese anagama kiln for some pots to go into an exhibition at the Embassy of Japan as part of the Oxford Research Centre in the Humanities Japan season. We'll be taking questions throughout. Um, it's a phenomenally interesting process. Robin will have lots to say about that later and we'll be speaking to people from the project as well. So please do get your questions in both the Torch YouTube channel and the Embassy YouTube channel and we'll get to those as we go along. But without further ado, I think it's time to open this kiln. So let's see what we get, shall we? Yeah, we've got a team over there. They, we've been holding them back from opening the, <laughs> opening the kiln for the last time. They've been, yeah, it's been they've kids been, on Christmas, hasn't it? They are. <laughs> it's, a, it's a bit like Christmas. They're desperate to get into the kiln and see yeah. what we've actually done. Um, so we ought to move over there. I can hear them. They're already scraping. Right, waiting. we'll go over there. So let's go over there and we'll see you in a mo. Let's get this thing open. Oh. oh, attention. Yeah. You can see some little guys in there. Peters. Oh. I haven't seen it yet. What's it like? Peters looks nice. I'm good, thank you. Oh, Josie, don't hog it. <laughs> What's he like? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, that's all right. <laughs> I think it's going to be okay. Oh. Uh, yeah. Do you want to yeah. get in there and just get some of this? Yeah, Maybe you put the bucket in there. Yeah. Okay, I think Ginger, go for it. Yeah. We'll start taking that. Yeah. Brilliant. And then as soon as you've got the door out, we can all have a look, possibly. Yeah. 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 It's a nice shine on the front. I think the Peter's pot looks like it's going to come out really nice. Yeah. It looks, well, we hope so. It looks like it. Yeah. 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 I guess he's taking the full whack of it, isn't it? Yeah, stuff landing on it, heat, you name it. Yeah, yeah, so if it works, it really works. They'll probably all need it actually. They're all quite feel together. No, you have to, I think you have to tap them all. <laughs> They're looking good from here. Yeah, 
More tension than normally. Are you dressed well enough to get into this kiln? You haven't worn your stuffy clothes yet. You're going to ruin yet another wonderful set of clothes. So now all the volunteers who have been on site to help with the firing are getting their we'll first look at the results. The we didn't actually know if we were going to get a successful firing or not, so this is all very exciting for everyone. Once we've got it open, we'll show you some clips from how the firing went. We'll talk a little bit about the firing process itself, and then we'll collect some of the pots that have turned out really well, and we'll talk a bit about how they've worked, if they've worked, and we'll also be talking to people who took part in the project and the outreach arms, uh, so they can let us know a little bit about how they approach making work to go in this very special kind of Japanese wood-fired kiln, the Anigama. That looks all right to me. It's hard to tell. I mean, this dusty thing is... I swear like, we put her on the left hand side. How is we she moved it like ten oh, times. Did it? Yeah. 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 Okay, she didn't move herself. Yeah. No, she didn't move <laughs> I moved at the very last moment because we yeah. had a pot exactly. on that. Side. Your connection with the project, how you found them taking part in the firing, she did not and then the your outreach, you know, your arm, so what you're trying to achieve with that, yeah, there's and then some of the work, show some of the work. I think that's like a nice three stages of the story. Yeah. Okay. Joseph and I can drop the pot. I'm sure <laughs> you film like anyone. Well, we saw again. already, you know, we've already, uh, got, we've already got the <laughs> we, were just, we, were just, we were just warming up. Yeah. <laughs> that was a small one. Yeah. We can bounce almost all of it. You're quite it. lucky there's an old stick. Great. Yeah. Yeah. The thing about it when you open it, it always looks. Yeah, yeah, dusty and, and grey, and you think, oh and no, you what have we done? And then when you take them out, they all come well, I don't think it looks like that at all. I think that's it's very dusty. It's quite sort of like, so sort of like, cool. Thank you, Kate. Right, let's get it out. Um, should we pop it down a bit? Where do you want it? Lewis Michael wants it more than one side. Yeah. And all the waddings come clean off it. Your yeah. wadding was yeah. good, Joseph. Yeah, well done, Joseph. Yeah. 
That's a Peter Sparry. He'll be pleased with that. He'll be dead pleased with that. So what's this wadding on the side? Was it was there something next to it, or was it going to? That was so we no. So we lent it against the kiln because I've had pot stick to the kiln before, and I didn't want it to have to be ground off the kiln. So knowing that there was going to be quite a lot of ash, I've, and we've done this further back, we've wadded some of the pot onto the, onto the side of the kiln. That's really good. Well done, Josie. Well done, everybody. Yeah, well, well done. That's brilliant. That's a good start. That's good. Crusty, but like that. That wadding on the side was. That is just fantastic. Good idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, there's more to come. There's more to come. That's the first, but the stuff out of the out of the bar pit's usually not the best. Yeah, yeah. It's not necessarily the best. Well, exactly. Yeah. We don't know what you put on today, do you? Do you know what page okay. it is? Did have a what did they do? It did. It did have a reaction. Where? Where? He said it had a flashing stuff on it. Where? And it, and it had a glaze inside, and the glaze has gone really nicely inside as well. Yeah. Yeah. Inside. Oh, wow, well, yeah. Oh, he has, he says, we've got it all documented. It's a shame that's Yeah, it is. The warding on the side, I told you the warding on the side would be good. I'm hoping the warding on the side Yeah, I think warding things onto the... Couldn't you, next time maybe you could put the warding in a shell? Next time we could tumble stack it. We could tumble stack the whole kill. Well, if the wadding's that good, yeah, yeah that is good. Why not? And the wadding just dropped off. Yeah, it was that's very good. Mm -hmm. It's a different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no purity of the. And then we'll make a start. So who's up? Who's going to start unloading it? Sharon. Sharon. Go on, please. Yeah. Yes. Yes. No. Can I use the shelf? Yeah. Yeah. You instruct us. You instruct us. So that first pot we saw coming out was by an artist called Peter Sparry, and now will be featured in the exhibition later this year. You'll see as we go to shots from the unloading itself, um, lots of different people. There was a huge amount of people involved in the firing process. Um, I was one of them um, from the embassy. And then there was also another 16 people from community organisations, lecturers at universities, potters, most of us first timers learning how to fire this kiln, um, all collaboratively and all of them put work into the kiln itself as well. So they'll have lots of fascinating things to tell us um, about how they got involved in the project, about how they approached the project and how they found the firing. So we'll come to that a bit later. Um, just whilst they get a few of the pots out of the kiln, we're going to talk about the process. So we'll go back to where it all began um, on Monday of last week. So here you can see all the pots pre-laid out on shelves as the loading was being planned. The reason this is done is because we had such a huge amount of pots from so many different people that we ended up with quite a random selection in some ways. Things weren't exactly the same height, things weren't the same shape, so it made the loading of the kiln very difficult. When you load a kiln of this kind, you need to think about the flow of the fire. You need to use pots to direct it. You need to be able to angle it. You need to be able to predict where the ash is going to go. So all of these things were in the minds of the potters who were here as we were planning how the shelves will look. You can see there, that's Joseph, who co-organized the firing, handling Peter Sparry's pot, which we just saw come out of the kiln. This piece is by a French artist, Claude Assange, who is a wood firer um, and a true expert. And these two tall pieces by Harriet Coleridge, who is another artist based in France and a wood firer who also was on the firing team. Some pieces here by Lisa Hammond um, and just in front of those you saw some work made by one of the outreach activities. So what we had going on in this kiln was work from fine artists, work from students. Fine, speaking of fine artists, this is Amanda Chambers who also produced a work. So in this one firing, we had work from fine artists, we had work from school students, we had work from community groups, we had work from up and coming potters, established potters. It was a really egalitarian firing. All of these things took place in the Anagama. It doesn't matter who or what has produced the pots. It was all about the leveling playing field of the Anagama. 
We also had artists producing things in a variety of clays, but nothing was glazed. So what we're going to see as more pots come out, we'll see just how those clays have responded to being fired in wood. We'll also see how the position in the kiln and how the loading took place affected the end results. So let's take a look now at the next stage of the process. So this part of the process is called wadding. Um, and you can see a few of us there, and actually the cultural attaché from the Embassy of Japan, Kaori Saiki, also got involved. Um, and essentially we're rolling a clay compound um, into balls and into cones, which we then stuck to the pieces, which is about to be demonstrated by Joseph. What this essentially does is, because there is so much ash in the kiln, you can end up where the ash melts, it will create a sort of seal and it will glue to anything it's touching, whether that's other parts or whether that is kiln shelves or even the side of the kiln itself. So any part of the pot that is coming into contact with anything else needs to be wadded. Um, for this firing, we didn't wad that many pots together, um, but you'll see an example in a moment of two pots being wadded together, and that is done to create a decorative effect. Um, so the part that has been wadded to the other pot is going to be protected from the flame and protected from the ash, and therefore will provide quite a strong contrast um, to the clay otherwise. So here you can see, I believe it's Joseph again, um, just sizing up um, if this small unomi uh, can fit on top of this or not. So where the rim connects to the shoulder of that vase, you'll essentially have a halo of strong contrast with the rest of the shoulder, which will have hopefully gathered a lot of ash if the firing has gone well. So you can see there again, we're actually just using that PVA glue, if you're wondering. Um, which all burns off in the kiln. At this stage, those are the kiln props that separate the kiln shelves. And what we're doing here is just making sure that once we've wadded the pots, are they actually going to fit on the shelf that we're intending them to do? So you can see it's being raised slightly. And that is essentially done to make sure that once everything is wadded together, how and if it will actually fit. Um, and we had to take out pot several times where things didn't quite work or didn't quite fit and things actually went inside the chimney flute as well. Um, this process we haven't captured everything to show you today. Uh, the reason for that is because we're going to have an exhibition at the Embassy of Japan at the end of this year uh, running through until February time um, and as part of that there has actually been a film produced um, where you'll get to learn much more about the process. Really what we're trying to capture today is the excitement of actually opening the kiln um, and we also want to take questions from you guys at home. Uh, so anyone watching, please do put your questions into YouTube and we'll get to them once we've got a uh, few pots out. Um, so we'll actually go and see the next stage of the process at this point. So this is the kiln pre-loading. So you can see it doesn't look like a huge space really. Um, and that's the chimney at the bottom, so you can see it's downdraft. And this is the first few pieces of work being loaded in. At the moment it hasn't got any shelves, um, and that's Joseph again climbing in to do the first part of the loading. But even in that space, we've managed to get around 300 pots in total in, um, from all the community groups, from the schools, from the outreach. Uh, the Oxford Research Centre and the Humanities did some outreach with local schools in Oxford. Um, the Embassy of Japan did some outreach with local potters and some uh, community groups in London and brought the pots up. And also Sundragon Pottery did some outreach workshops as well in Birmingham. So there's been a lot of outreach going on um, essentially trying to increase accessibility to these kind of kilns, which are phenomenally expensive to fire, um, but produce fantastic results. So the idea is to kind of create a space and a kiln that is working for potters in this country um, to have access to a Japanese firing technique that is, you know, not so easy to access. And so this moon jar has been loaded in um, into the chimney to essentially trap the flame inside the kiln. If you had the flame running straight out, it would be firing very inefficiently, um, which you don't really want. You want to try and trap the heat. So there's a few items put in there, um, but those items are in one of the cooler sections of the kiln. So they get lots of flaming, but they don't get a huge amount of heat, which means they can still be a bit fragile at the end, um, but they get some decorative effects. Um, at this point, we're just watching a time lapse of us loading the back stack. Um, which for the same reason as putting the pot in the chimney is you want it to be a little bit dense back there um, because you want to try and trap the flame. So these pots are going sort of half a centimetre apart 
um, and trying to think about where is that flame going to go, not leaving any obvious gaps uh, that the flame can escape from. Loading, reloading, twisting, thinking, arguing with other potters because everyone has a different idea. Um, not the bad kind of arguing, obviously, the good kind of arguing where it's just people's creative ideas bouncing off each other. Um, and it's all done in a true collaborative spirit. So we'll watch this time lapse. You might be wondering why there's so many bottles um, going in and lidded things, and that's partly because people will have thought, well, what takes the ash well? And flat surfaces take the ash very well. Um, so, and here's Joseph essentially using a spirit level to make sure that kiln is straight. These pots are being loaded into a kind of valley, um, which will separate out the two kiln shelves um, and allow space for the heat to build. And this is what it looked like once we'd put in our second stack at the front. Um, and that's one of the kiln goddesses. We had one inside the kiln and one on top of the kiln. Um, so, you know, people's response to this, some people made sculptural work, some people made functional work, some people threw things, some people made pinch pots. I mean, everyone's approach to it was different. Um, so we really have been astonished by how many things we've got. You may have noticed in the video, there was three small cones. Um, ceramicists will know what those are for. Um, other people may not. Uh, they're pyrometric cones, which are a ceramic material that are designed to melt at specific temperatures. Um, and we're not talking temperature like temperature temperature, we're talking heat work. So how much heat work has actually been absorbed by the clay? Uh, so one of the ways we have of measuring temperature in the kiln is using pyrometers. And there'll be two inside the kiln, which we're reading throughout the firing process. But the real key to knowing have you got the right amount of heat work into your ceramics or not, is using those pyrometric cones. So they were placed in various points in the kiln because the kiln doesn't heat up evenly. Um, and we were checking those throughout the firing to see how we were doing. And once all three cones, each cone melts at a slightly different temperature. And our goal was to get up to cone 12, the final cone. Um, once that had bent completely over, we knew we'd achieved our top temperature. Um, top temperature isn't everything. So we've spent the last few days panicking. You know, is this actually going to turn out well or not? Because the ashing all comes into what decorative effects you're going to get. Um, so just because we achieved temperature, yeah, that was the first hurdle, but does that actually mean we're going to get good pots or not? We didn't know. Um, so let's take a wee look at what happened in the firing itself, because that was obviously very exciting. Oh, my apologies. I'm, I'm one video ahead of myself. This is us um, bricking up the kiln. So after we'd finished loading, um, we put in some bricks and a firebox, which is where we were stoking from. Um, so here you can see the team rebuilding that uh, archway which we took out uh, just 10 minutes ago um, and once it's done it was sealed up with some clay and water mixture um, just to try to avoid some heat loss um, and you can see there an awful lot of wood that went into the firing and we'll talk about the environmental aspect of this later because it's very interesting um, you know you might think that because there's so much wood involved it's not an environmental firing um, but this firing was glaze free and glaze has a absolute, well, or the materials that go into glaze has an astonishingly high uh, environmental impact whereby, you know, lots of the materials, sorry, lots of the materials that are mined for glaze come from open pit mines, um, often mined by children. Um, and it's one element of ceramics that is slightly uh, ignored or neglected by ceramicists and um, the environmental impact of glaze making. So although we got through an awful lot of wood to do this firing, the fact that all 300 pieces didn't have any glaze materials on them means that there is actually an environmental argument for wood firing. Um, Wytham Woods itself is also managed forest land and all the wood we used would have gone to waste otherwise. Um, so, you know, this wood, it's sort of served its purpose, it's being reused, it's being reclaimed. Um, Robin will tell you much more about that side of the project because obviously he's the aspect. Uh, expert even. He's actually just appearing. I'm wondering, do I grab him? Robin, do you mind just quickly jumping in and telling me about the wood, specifically the wood that we're using here um, and the forest and, you know, and then the connection there? 
Um, yeah, of course. So what we've got, um, the wood that's surrounding us is mostly softwood. It's western yeah. red cedar, which is Thuya. It's part of the university's mm. um, uh, woodland. We're surrounded by a thousand acres here. It's being managed by the university. We're converting a lot of our pine forest back into deciduous high woodland. Right. And we're doing that by taking out some of the pine, which is very convenient because it, it, it's, a, it's very useful for this firing. So. Yeah. And I remember you saying the pine was originally planted for commercial purposes and that replaced the Yeah, we had a forestry woodland. department here yeah. in, the, in the 30s and 40s and so, so it was planted then in stands okay. for what would then be useful. But it, it's, it's, it's not something we want in the woods now at no. all. So we're, we're taking it out, we've got a lot of it, mm. um, and we're replacing it now with oak and beech and ash. Okay. Um, and and part, part of that is, is to create a, a deciduous mixed uh, forest, a yeah. natural forest, for, for, for part of the study and for, um, for, the, for the reasons of of um, just continuing to, to, to make the woodlands uh, more natural. Yes, um, exactly. But during that process, the removal, we have the benefit of being able to burn it. Yes. Because otherwise it a would happy, just happy be waste wood. It's a happy yeah. coincidence, which I yeah. noticed when we set up the project, that there was a lot of wood being, being felled mm. and taken out. And again, you, you, the hardwood, because we're burning hardwood here as well. So we, we, when we fired the kiln, we yeah. had um, beech and quite a lot of ash. We're taking that out because we're starting to thin our mm. stands. As they grow, as they mature, you take, you take trees out, uh, as you get when you plant yeah. a, uh, radishes, you have to thin them yeah. in order for the things that to remain to grow to the, and reach mm. their full potential. Okay. So, we've got, so that's where our hardwood comes from, from the thinning of stands and from the ongoing management of the woods. Okay. And then the softwood, which is the majority, is the bulk of what we're burning in the kilns, is, is stuff that we're actually taking out of the woods and replacing. Yeah. Um, and we're surrounding with this is more for the next firing and we yeah it's it's good it's a good use for it and it is a fantastic use for it and we were saying just a sec or just before you arrived i was saying well look the environmental cost of burning wood that there is a question mark there yeah there is but there is yeah. also a huge reduction in glazed materials that didn't go into that kiln yeah. as a result of using the decoration from the wood i don't think this is something you could do anyway with this mm. We're not cutting down wood to do this. Yeah. Wood is being cut down, yeah. and we're You're using putting it, it and, to use. and we're putting it to use, which yeah. is quite different. Yeah. So I wouldn't say that this is something that mm. that that I would imagine everyone should be trying to do. No, of course it's, not. It's a yeah. rarity. Yeah. It's a chance rarity, and I think it's something that we're making the kilns fire as efficiently as we possibly can. Mm. And and because there's an educative program here, yeah. I think we're trying to trying to make sure that what goes into the kilns has meaning, and. And last, it's not something that we, mm. we discard. We're not producing discardable items. We're, no. we're trying to produce things that make people think and, and items that will that will be durable and remain. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think just to pick up on one thing, but there you is just a question said, there. There is a question this, there. with the wood. And, I, and is the answer to say, right, get rid of glaze and everyone fire in wood? Definitely not. No. You know, this project occupies a unique space yeah. in some respects, insofar as it is capitalised on the moment. There are, there are moment. places in the world where yeah. where where this kind of forest management is producing mm. surplus wood. And, but I think it need, you need care with what you then fire. You need yeah, care with what you need to put in. It, this isn't just a, an idle fancy that we'll just put some pots in the, mm. in the kiln. I think you really have to think about it. I think you, you have do, to, yeah. and, and, that's, and that's really what we're doing. We're, we're trying mm. to make people think about where their things come from yeah. and not to discard their things and to make things that they want to keep. So mm. again, this wood hasn't come from anywhere. It's come from here. It hasn't mm. been driven in here. Yeah. The pots that we're making are not then being Containered across the world or taken place. No. They're made here. Used they are here. here. They're used here. So, yeah. so in some, it would be interesting to study the actual mm. energy usage to produce pots and yeah, then see yeah. what their lifetime is. And, and, and partly, sure I've been over and over the lifetime. Yeah, you know, over sure the lifetime find, of, mm. of the pots. How long will they last? Yeah. You're not, you really aren't producing things here which are going to be thrown away next year. Of course, year. I mean, pots are some of the only items we have left of some civilizations. So, you know, these things are yeah, not going anywhere They'll fast. last. They no, will, no, They'll yeah, last, they which, is, which makes it worth burning this wood, perhaps. Yeah, it's I certainly so. arguable, and yeah. it, it's certainly uh, a debate that, that, that ought to be had. Yeah, and, and one that sure. we are having. It's not unthought about, certainly. Right, a monstrous plane is about to come over There is a monstrous so plane about to come over our head. Uh, for us to take a look at the firing process, speaking of burning wood. So let's take yeah. a little bit look at how that went. So here you can see stoking happening in both fireboxes at this point. What temperature do you reckon we were here at this point, Robin? Uh, you've got both fireboxes open, so yeah. I think you're probably about 11.50. Yeah, and we can see some of the pots of there through the, that's through the chimney at the back. And, and that's looking a down. heavily reducing flame. You can, mm. tell, you can tell the oxidation reduction state of the kiln by looking at the, at the flame. Mm -hmm. Although we've got pyrometers and things stuck in the top of it, you actually don't need them to fire it. What, what I was trying to get these, look at the, the records that we're yeah. keeping. 
The pyrometers are interesting. It allows us to make comparable uh, comments about previous firings and so forth. Mm. But really, you don't need it. And what I was doing was teaching the, the team here to fire this kiln without, without the pyros. You just mm. you don't need it. You need to listen to the kiln. You need to respond to what it tells you to do. Yeah. Um, and there are various stages that we go through, which become quite obvious as, mm. you, as you listen to the kiln. And it, it, it's quite easy to pick it up. Once you know that you should be listening for a certain a crack or you should mm. be listening for that deep body whoosh as the, as the, as the air is brought, in, yeah, brought the into the kiln draw. and combust. Yeah. It, once your attention has been drawn to the to the physical mm. uh, sounds and things that are around you, actually these kilns are quite easy to fire. Yeah, I mean, I was actually very surprised. I remember yeah. on the first day when we were still in the loading phases and you were saying all of these things, and I imagined, gosh, how on earth are we going <laughs> to... I'm not a kiln whisperer. How am no, I going to no, be able to do this? I thought that came with years and years. No, but no. They make it quite obvious, especially the draw. You could really hear when the you were draw, getting a good amount of oxygen the crackle, in there. Yeah. The, the, the visible appearance of the pots changes as you mm. go through the temperature ranges, so you can start to see the doneness of the pot. Yeah. There are pyrometric cones in there, and they help, yeah. but you don't really need that. You can no. see the doneness of it. You can see the build-up of the ash. Yeah. You can start to, and we do things like drawing out, um, drawing out the rings. Yes. Do you remember? Yeah. Now, and you can see whether your clay mm. has been done. If it's done on the clay ring that you've drawn out, then it's likely to be done on the pot that, mm. that you've left in there. Yeah. So, so there are physical tricks as well as the as well as having the electronics, which yeah. which I kind of try and get people to ignore. Yeah. To well, extent. you know, well, when it's these kilns were first fired, no one had pyrometric cones, no, no one had pyrometers. Not. You know, it's really good to. Actually, writing down the numbers is quite mm. good because it keeps a focus. If you're doing, because there was a big team on this occasion, yeah. you were doing four-hour shifts. We sometimes do eight or twelve-hour shifts. Yeah. Actually, writing down the numbers, it's quite nice because it keeps your attention going mm. over long periods. I mean, yeah, we're firing well, need two or three yeah. in the morning. I don't mm. know if you've spoken about this, but not quite yet. Yeah. I mean, I've kept, it, I've kept it on the rosy side. For yeah, now. this isn't <laughs> something that you <laughs> fire just by turning up in the morning and sort mm. of bunging a bit of wood. Yeah. This is round the clock. Yeah. And the kiln that's behind us, this is, t this is, this is eight or nine days of firing round the clock. Yeah. It's like, and it's like driving down a motorway. Mm. You can't take your eyes off it. No, you can't. You have any lapse of concentration can really and cause trouble. It takes six or seven. And with these, you can take six or seven hours yeah. to, to make up five minutes of inattention. Mm. Yeah. And because and there were so many amateurs doing it this time, did you, you know, I'm sure you must have found that the ramps and things were taking ever so slightly longer because there was it, always that learning period as the teams changed over. You I know. was surprised at how quickly everybody learned, actually. Oh, it went really well. No, it that, went really well. We'll come back, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you might even be allowed to come back. Yeah, no, it's yeah. really good. It's, as soon as you've had your attention drawn to, to, to the various things, it, you just have to keep your ears and your eyes on those things. Mm. And when they start to change, you then have to start to think, do I need to, to improve what I was yeah. doing? Do I need to just switch on a bit better? Yeah, yeah. And, and the fixes, once I told you what, how you fix the things, yeah. actually you do it. Yeah. You know, the air's not drawing, what do I do? We start to turn the wood. We, yeah. start, we start to think, is there an, a big enough air gap? Is there too much? Do we need to rake a little bit underneath? Mm -hmm. And as soon as you're doing that, the, the, the range of things you can do here isn't great. Mm. But, the, but being on top of them every moment, Yeah, yeah. Is, is nudging this always, always from, from, from the mediocre into, mm. into the perfect. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. It's quite easy to fire these badly. <laughs> it really is quite easy. To, yeah. You just put wood in it and you can well, fire How's it looking, badly. actually? Fine. Is it looking like well, an okay firing? Uh, you haven't seen it yet, I have haven't. You? I've been in here with the oh, camera. I'm going to tell you so, that. Oh, jeez. No, there's some really... There's some great pots? Yeah, no, I'm... Fantastic. I mean, happy. I saw Peter. Yeah, you that know, is good. There's some really good stuff. Fantastic. Out of there. It's, they've great. fired it well. Some good stuff has gone in yeah. and some nice stuff has come out. And, Fantastic. You know, it's, no, well, I think that's I'm a really good time pleased. then to actually start gathering some pots to show everybody. Yeah, and there'll be a little bit of a lull um, where no one will be talking to you just for a moment as we get ready. But we'll talk to some of the collaborators. Um, and this is also a great opportunity to thank Robin and the Oxford University Kilns um, for not only being here and helping with it, but also their financial support. Um, and also the Oxford Research Centre in the Humanities and their Japan Season, who also are financially supporting this. Um, and we at the embassy were so thrilled um, to be able to do this with you. It's been a really fun... a tight timeline, it if I remember. It was quite a tight <laughs> timeline through no fault of our own. <laughs> yeah. We've had to do this. Oh, that's what we say. We've had that's to do this rather quickly. Yeah. Um, and it's gone really well. It's yeah. amazing. Everyone's yeah. come together. People produce pots in time. Yeah. Um, we've had a greater response than I had thought. I mm. had no idea that this would be yeah, so it's popular. It's been phenomenal, hasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's been phenomenal. The team has been great. Everyone has, has turned up and brought more people. It's, it's, it's yeah. been a wonderful thing. Yeah, uh, yeah. And everyone has learned a lot very quickly. Uh, and I'm quite confident that 
the, the same team could fire this again. Well, there you go. And, there's no and they all want to come back, which, is, come which back. is a nice I know. compliment. I know, so um, it's so strange, isn't it? And the it, catering's you know? been good. The cake has been very good. The cake, um, cake has kept everyone going. But the pots coming out are really good, and we probably ought to go and have a We ought to go and get some. So we'll be back very soon um, with some interesting pots, so don't go away. And if any of that has interested you, do get some questions into the yeah, chat do on send YouTube. Some... We would like to actually ask, answer your questions rather than Robin and I just kind of rabbiting yeah, on. Yeah, I can talk about this forever. Yeah. Um, but you could... If you have any questions, once you've seen some pots, mm. it'll be more obvious what, yeah. what you should be asking. Um, and we can talk you through some of the pots. We can talk you through. We've got some of the makers who can talk you through yeah, yeah. their, their pots and their, and their experience yeah, yeah. of firing it, because their experience is, is again quite raw and quite unfiltered, and they'll mm. be able to talk to you yeah. about having done it for the first time and what they what's different to this. They're all potters, but but this is quite different for most of the people who are participating. They haven't seen this kind of result before. Mm. So it's, yeah. it, it'll be interesting to get their first reactions from these things. It will. So we'll oh. be back shortly with some pots. Don't go away. Are we, are we on back stack yet? We're on Don't the, think so. No, we're in front of the side stage being sounded. The heart looks oh, pretty wild as well. Bridget, you are taking Bridget. Bridget, you are doing line for line. Super, fantastic, thank you. Front of the bottom, so yeah, so Stuff, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, just look at this. 
Public thing to open it. <laughs> Quite so. It's a size of relief, isn't it? Really? Just slightly. <laughs> yeah. That looks like um, yeah. an angel. An angel, doesn't it? Yeah. Yes. There's some sequoia as well that he did, which I do have to mention. <laughs> right, here we are. We're back here with Raf, who's had a fantastic piece out of the kiln. Um, are you happy with it, Raf? I love it. It's yeah. just amazing. Yeah. The way the, the ash built inside the kiln is perfect. On one side. Yeah. Do you want to show it up right up to the camera? Let's get it in there so people can, at home can see. Just up ever so slightly. Look at that. So you can see the yellowing. What other features are, are, you, are you enjoying about this piece, Raph? I love the way the ash react, the flame, and the ash were building in one of the sizes. Mm. And then you have all the other way. The evenness of the, of the ash building in the mask is beautiful. Mm. And the connection with the, with the other side, piece. Isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's the beautiful. Kiln, maybe that little patch. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting the way the, the fire has worked because yeah, yeah. It's, in, it's all around inside too. Can mm. you see it? Yeah. And it's also, can you notice these cracks there at home? I, I remember being very worried putting it into the kiln, thinking, oh, God, is it going to survive? But you told me it's actually uh, intentional. Intentional to uh, allow the mass mm. to drink and pull yeah. without any, causing any damage into the front. Yeah. And basically, all the stress, I hold it at the back. Mm -hmm. I normally do four lines mm -hmm. to hold them. Yeah. And the way the mass go, the particular mass go, mm. it go like this. Okay. And uh, it's, a, it's a reference to the fair, English fair, when you have the gorging competitions. Okay. And, and it's a little bit about how I'm feeling at the moment. I don't mm. know how. Mm. I don't You're know. kind of capturing it. Like, yeah, we've yeah. still got a bit of wadding, obviously, which will come off this part, isn't it? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. This, this is a little bit. That's yeah. not going to be any problem. No, no, that will come gonna off be, easy. It's going to make it even more interesting after we remove yeah, it. Yeah, it'll be the patch, isn't it? They'll, yeah. Yeah, where, the, where it's been protected from the flame and protected from the ash. Yeah. But tell me more about masks. Why do masks feature in your practice? Well, for me, for me, when I moved to England 20 years yeah. ago, yeah. The, one of the first places that I went to visit was the Pitt Rivers yeah. Museum. Pitt Rivers, yeah. And the Pitt River was a fantastic place for me because when I arrived, I don't speak any English. Mm. And for me, it wasn't a way to be in connection with culture from all the world, understanding a little bit what hot for mm -hmm. about. And the Pier River was a place with full of very quirky and cultural mm. uh, museum. Yeah. And what I like, the, one of the things I more like was the collection of masks mm. from all over the culture. Because I was working before I moved to England, I was working in, in performance. Okay. And I was working in performance as a way of working ritualistic. Okay. And the mass are part of that ritual. Mm. Uh, basically, all the one thing connect me with the other one. Yeah. The collection started to encourage me to produce more mass. By mm. that moment, I wasn't making pottery. Okay. Uh, Not pottery yet. coming, mm. coming later. I, long later, mm -hmm. a few years later, and yeah. then I started to work with mass. And I've been doing a lot of pottery. I've been learning everything about pottery. Yeah. And firing was something who fascinated me 10 years ago, mm. and I continue learning. Mm. But this particular firing, what I find about this particular, was the pace. Everything mm. happened so lovely. Yeah, yeah. Like in no hurry, it was no, no, no real effort in mm. the way we had to deal. It was very lovely the way we can interacted with each other, was really nice the way we work with each other, was really nice the way everybody worked together, the yeah. harmony, maybe the amount of people who were working. Mm. Made the, the pace, fire. although yeah. there was intensity, the pace, it didn't feel stressful, did it? No, it because was, you we, know, we were covering each other and making sure people were resting. And everybody was doing the same thing. That's yeah. what I more like it. Like, sometimes you have one people doing something and then another one doing something, but because it was, uh, 
all the time was somebody working in mm. the in the kiln who knows exactly yes. what we're doing. Yes. We basically were repeating the same thing, yeah. and that gave it like the harmonious effect in the mm. firing by because yeah. we don't want improvising anything. Yeah. We just were learning how to do it. Yeah. And the process of learning for me was beautiful because was yeah. totally you before though, yeah, right? you, you know, done so you kind of were familiar with how the kiln works, knew the signs. We're about to get a plane, but hopefully we can carry on talking. <laughs> a few of those, you know, you think, oh, we're in a thousand acres of woodland, the most beautiful place on earth. But then it's also, you know, they do love to send them over. <laughs> <laughs> well, we are yeah. in Oxford. Yeah, that's it. So, you know, we're still in Oxford. It yeah. feels like nature, but we are still in Oxford. Yes. About 10 minutes drive, actually. And um, the woods are open to the public, I believe, you know, for people yeah. to come and have walks and all that sort of stuff. So it's a fantastic place to visit. It's a very, you know, charming place. It's absolutely gorgeous. The walks around here yeah. are amazing. Uh, it's a lot of research has been done in this place, basically. This is why the wood have been keeping so beautiful because have been I suppose have been on the very very well look after mm. and the team who look uh, who working here very good yeah. people with a lot of experience yeah, yeah. the people who are working all the rest of the working mm. here is make you feel at home yeah 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 it's we very also nice very quickly I was so surprised you know yeah. and everyone's been so friendly and accommodating and all the staff you know, have been yeah. helpful and everyone's been there. Yeah, they, they, they never say, if they can do it, they say, yeah, come on. Yeah, yeah, that's let's it. do it. It's, it's always a yes, you know, yeah. you very rarely got a no, did you? Everyone yeah, was just positive attitude, let's make this work, let's do this, you know. And, 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 and then look at the results we get because of it. It's fantastic. This is beautiful. That's a you know, really, so proud, really man. special piece. You should be, that is a really special piece. Yeah. Well, thanks for talking us to us, Raf. Let's go crack on, help the guys. Yes. Yeah, thank you. No worries. Thank you. He looks like a he looks like a tapper off a wadi. Well, so where are we now? So this is now the valley. So this, this was in the valley between the stacks. So we're now moving on to back stack. Did you like that? I was hoping it was going to create a bit of. Well, we haven't seen the back stack yet. The claws has come out really nicely, and it didn't take too much of the firebox either, yeah. which is really good. Robin, do you want to talk to Austin about his pots so people can have a break from listening to me? Yeah, I can talk to Austin about his great, pots. Great. I might take some. Hey, good to see you again. I sent an email. Yeah, did you get it? Okay, you did get it. Cool, cool. Yeah. No, no, that's fine. I just wanted to make sure I got the right address. Yeah, so I'll okay. carry a few little things. Yeah, it's like it's a bit of 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 Yeah, good. Yeah. 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 Very nice. Yeah. The patch, that patch of black really makes it. Yeah. So, we're having a look at some of the pots. Austin here is from um, Sun Dragon, which is a community pottery in Birmingham. Um, right. Do you want to tell us a little bit about? I mean, this is these are exciting. We've just got these out, so it's very hard not to to talk about the pots. Do you want to tell us about the pots? What have you got out? It's a uh, raku clay, and it's just been shampered with a, a flat piece of wood and then just tidy it up a little bit with a surf horn blade so you get it a bit sharper just so it picks up some ash just on the edges of things to show the contrast and show the front and then the back see the joy of these kilns is that is that the what comes out of them is distinctly not uniform it, it's it's got a unidirectional blast, so, you, so, the, so the, the flame is blasting through the kiln and it hits the front side of the pot, wraps around, and then the, and then the rear side gets much less, much less ashing. This, this is, is, is a really lovely thing here. I don't know if you can see this. There we go. See, it's got a, it's got a distinct, it's got a front 
This front has been blasted, it's covered with ash, it's running. This is the ash from the fuel that we fired the kilns with. So this is an unglazed pot which has been auto-glazed as an incidental effect of the firing process. It's a beautiful incidental effect. But this yellow and the green, this is the wood we used to fire it with. This is the ash and the beech and the pine that we've used it. And on the back, if you turn it over, you see, that's where the flame is wrapped around. So you get, so you get a distinct topography of these pots. They're not meant to be, to be uniform all over. They're a terrible thing for trying to produce uh, uniform sets of the same thing. This, you could never produce another of these because it depends upon where you loaded it, what it was sat next to, where it was in the kiln. We can never do that again. And that's its real joy. It's, let me put this one down. Oh, another one. Yeah, have you got another one? Sure, let's have a look at another one. Slightly different position in the kiln as well. There we go. Is this another of yours? It looks yeah. like yours. So that's done the same way. Just pressed into those kind of areas that are there we go. So that's the front. Look at the ash running down here. And if you're part of the, the joy of these kilns is the serendipity. It's the accidental process of the ash runs. So you get good drips and bad drips. Let's have a look at those again. Show, hold them up to the camera. See, those are good drips. They're lovely. If you look at them closely, there's, there's a lot of texture in there. There's, you can see the crystal formation in there. And then they run to these beautiful... Uh, bidoro, the, 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 the glassy end nodules. And they haven't run off the pot, they've run on one side, so again, if you, the, it has a front face and a back face. And that's, and it's got a lighter face at the back where the, where the flame has wrapped around it. That's lovely, that's really nice. Do you know where that was in the kiln? Uh, back top. Back top. So, at the moment, we're, when we're opening the kiln, we're about halfway through the opening at the moment. So we've, so this was on the front top shelf, so it's, I was expecting this to get a lot of ash. I was expecting it to get blasted, and that's why I put it there. The back top, I was expecting, I didn't know whether the ash was going to get there or not. But I, because I, when I asked people to come and contribute to this, I said, don't glaze your pots. So nothing really that went in there had, had a glaze, apart from one or two had lining glazes. Um, so we could fire the kiln really high. So we, we didn't have to stop. We didn't have to worry about glazes running off the pots or anything like that. Um, and it means that we've been able to get ashing uh, all the way back into the kiln. It looks as if we've got ash right to the very back. And if this was back that top... Was pretty much right to the back. That's, that's traditionally the coldest part of this kiln. Because it draws... Uh, the, the tunnel, the chimney, draws from the bottom of the kiln. It, you tend to get a, a cold area at the top above it. Um, part of my concern when I was firing this was to get the flame and the heat in the, in the relatively cold top back. And if that pot's come from it, I didn't see it come out, yeah. but that's clearly getting ashing all the way back, which is exactly what I wanted, which makes me um, very pleased. It's, um, I'm kind of keen to go and see what else is coming out. It's um, hopefully, oh, we'll be able to go over and see what's happening here. The wadding, look, we've still got some wadding in here. Um, mostly that taps off. So with, um, with these type of kilns, you, you have to, yeah. There you go, well done. Very good. Yeah, you, ha you have to wad everything. So every surface that's going to touch every other surface has to be wadded to stop it sticking. Um, you still have problems when, when you get glaze. You're just about to break that pot in half, aren't you? <laughs> so everything is wadded to, to stop it sticking. And, you're, and, you just, and it should just tap off at the end. That's got quite a lot of wadding in it, to be honest. It's a bit huge. Um, yeah, it has. Let me have a look at this one again. That's clear on the bottom. It's only a very little bit left. Yeah, see, the wadding's come straight off that. It's lovely. That's oh, brilliant. Nice. Oh, perfect. Even an indent. Yeah, oh, that's really good. No, lovely. So I'm going to go over and get some more pots, and then we can have a look, um, a look at what else is coming out of the kiln, shall we? Cool. Excellent. Um, so I've been monitoring everyone's questions. Thank you so much for interacting and asking. Um, and now I have Robin and Joseph here to answer some questions that we've been having in. Um, so a really great question from Sarah Howard is, congratulations team on a successful firing. I'm curious to know <laughs> if you used a different type of wood for the firing and would it change the finish of the ceramic in terms of colour or glossiness? Yes. 
Would you like to explain <laughs> a bit further? <laughs> Is, yeah. So, so I've, I was talking earlier about the woods we're firing with. We're firing with mm. western red cedar, which is, mm -hmm. uh, which is the pine. That gives us the, the early spike in temperature. Yeah. That's the softwood. Okay. And as we get, as the kiln gets hotter and yeah. hotter, we move on. We we start to switch in a, yeah. a greater proportion of hardwood, yeah, yeah. which is ash. The the and Joseph knows a, a lot mm -hmm. about this because he studies ash glazes. But yeah. it's in essence the the minerals that are in that are taken up by the tree. Mm come out in the combustion so okay, so yeah. when you look at red pine yeah. which the Japanese in Bison would be yeah. using to burn these kind of kilns mm -hmm. their glaze this glaze is a slightly different color on their Did pots to yeah. ours yeah. so yeah you can see yeah, what, yeah. what's happening we've got these lovely mustard mm -hmm. yellows mm -hmm. you see slightly different colors in the Japanese pots they and also that's, have, that's because this is the fuel wood they okay. also have a lot of chestnut they burn with don't they in yeah Japan? Okay. so and chestnut produces a particular type of okay. finish on the pot yeah. so the, the green so particularly not it doesn't affect so much the the, the, the flame painting of mm. the of the base mm. of the pot, but it does affect the, the, the colour of the ash that's building up on mm. on the particularly on the pots at the front. So you, so the greens and the yellows yeah. that just reflects entirely what we're burning. Okay, and yeah. so for example, you said before we were using a lot of red cedar. Yeah. Um, so in terms of colour, what would that end up being? That gives you this lovely mustardy yellow. Okay, so that kind of yeah, the mustardy yellow like red cedar. and the it greens. Comes from the okay. is there. exactly. Um, yeah, and so sort of following on from the questions about ash glazes is, could you use the ash to make glazes? Yes. From the firing, <laughs> yeah. so I've been told that it gets calcined. Okay. So once it once you've used it at such high temperatures. Um, it becomes calcified, so mm. you can't really use it. But, um, Although people do, people do. So, okay. so it's very. We're not really making up ash glazes. This is an auto glaze. Yeah. All of this stuff went in unglazed. Mm -hmm. So, so any anything that you think is a glaze is in fact a side effect of just the firing process firing on raw clay. Wood. Mm. And that's and, and that's what firing wood in these anagamas is about. Mm. You're trying not. You're trying un, unlike it being a, say, just a hot box. These these kilns aren't aren't just heating up, they're heating up and then pushing ash mm -hmm. and flame through the pots. Mm -hmm. And that's really creating the effects that you're seeing, rather than the potter creating them with a glaze mm -hmm. and, and design. This is the serendipity of the of the process, of the, of the process mm -hmm. and we're loading it mm -hmm. with that to in try mind. And, yeah, with, to try and create the painting itself. And you yeah. can see you have two you sides. You have two sides of the pot as well. Mm -hmm. yeah, One okay. that faces into the firebox, yeah. which would be this side, where it's heavily ash, yeah. and then you have this side which is shielded. Mm -hmm. um, the, the ash builds up and then mm -hmm. it starts to run when it gets to a really hot temperature mm -hmm. and create a natural glaze matrix. Mm -hmm. yeah. You see so many glaze, sides to it. And then this glaze is just from the it's ash? purely produced from the fly ash that lands on the yeah. pot, accumulates yeah. over time. This isn't a glaze. This, mm -hmm. on, this, this brown isn't glazing. Mm -hmm. okay. This is just the effect of the, of the flame passing yeah. across the, the bare body of the clay. Okay. That's lovely. Thank you. Did and you so you're getting you're getting oxidation. Like yeah, you're getting so oxidation so reduction sexy. effect. Yeah. Let me try and Yeah, I think that's so look, good. You can so see it's that. like um, so for example, like that streak, was that also from the um, the type of wood that we were burning? Yeah, so this like is the this is the ash that's landing upon it. As as you get mm -hmm. um, molten fly ash coming off the off the uh, fuel fire that we're that we're firing the kiln with, it adheres to all of the c cooling surfaces, mm. on, which means the inside of the kiln, yeah. all the pots, the, all of the all of the surfaces get this build up, yeah. and it it does what you'd expect when it reaches a certain level, it starts to run. So you get these beautiful runs coming down, and, and a lot of the pots I've seen coming out here, we're starting to get runs and, and lovely running ash. Look at this. Mm -hmm. This is a beautiful oh, thing. That's great. Um, and then we have. Um, Oh, from Ethan Powell. If you could change one thing about this firing, what would it be? Ooh. That's a really good I question. It's always like, we'd always want to say we'd soak it longer at top temperature. What do you mean soak so it longer? We, when we get it to top temperature yeah. and we produce all this fly ash in yeah. the atmosphere and yeah. it lands on the pots, yeah. the fly ash is still pretty dry when okay. a new fly ash that lands on the pots. And when you soak it, yeah. you have it at top temperature mm. and it stays at that top mm. temperature for a period of time. Okay. So it gives enough time for the new ash yeah. to actually start to melt into the actual glaze that's been produced. Okay. So we soaked it, but there's always a tendency to want to soak it just for that bit longer. So we could have done another hour or two, but I don't get yeah. I don't think we needed to. Okay. You don't I get think certain I but the results are great. I the mean, results so mm, far from yeah, what I've seen are just really, 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 really But you would have to soak it for say you wouldn't just soak it for another hour longer. You would probably soak it for Four hours longer, so you can mm. really gauge the, mm. what the actual soap does, rather yeah. than just. Yeah, like I'm not sure I would have. Yeah. I'm not sure I've changed very much. I'm, 
we didn't have much lead-in time, so we didn't yeah. have a lot of time to prepare people for this or to do any um, serious educative work. Mm. So, so actually, I wouldn't have changed the firing. Okay, yeah. I think I would have changed the way that we, because we had a lot of schools involvement mm, with yeah. this. I think I would have liked to have built this into uh, into more national curriculum type okay, access, so, yeah, so people yeah. appreciate yeah. a little bit more about what we're doing. It'd be yeah, nice to have had time beforehand yeah, yeah. to actually go out with some of these pods and say, look, yeah. we could produce this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I see what you mean by the firing. You know, yeah. So I think yeah. the firing, yeah. looking at the actual physical yeah. firing is great, but it's the things that have sit, sat around mm. the firing. And a work done. around it that yeah. took the Yeah, nor, I mean, normally so, we spend a bit more time doing this. Yeah. Um, and with preparation, so so that's all I'd have done. So yeah. looking at the firing, I think okay. it's. Okay. All right. Great. So really the actual firing yeah. with the kiln was the easy thing. Wasn't yeah, it? yeah firing with the kiln is the easy part. To be yeah. honest, it's all of the. It's, it's actually making it count. Yeah. That's difficult, and okay. I think that pre-preparatory process I'd have liked to have had a bit more time. All right. Okay. <laughs> um, and then there was one question before. I think I remember, but it's gone now. But um, there was also a question like, why uh, are the pots cool to the touch, even though we're just taking them out of the kiln right now? Um, we we finished firing on mm. uh, Friday. On Friday. Okay, yeah. So Three o'clock on Friday. Wednesday. Yep. So it's had four days of cooling. Okay. Yeah. We allow up, enough time for yeah, it to cool down. It, it takes as long to cool down as it takes to mm. go up. This this small kiln that we've just fired mm. takes four days to to really to fire yeah, the yeah. thing, okay. um, to get it up to up yeah. to stoneware temperature, mm -hmm. to get it up to cone 12. Yeah. Takes about three or four days for it to come down. Mm -hmm. Yesterday okay, it was yeah. at 58 degrees on okay, the pyrometers, yeah. All right. and we, we opened up some of the vents to yeah. help cool it. It's okay. actually still hot in there, so when we're taking pots out, they're okay. still hot to the touch, mm -hmm. okay. and warm, sat yeah. in there it's still hot. Yeah, okay, but so it's still warm, it's a yeah, it's not, temperature. Yeah. You, could have, you could have yeah. unloaded a little earlier, we could have unloaded yesterday, I suppose. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have gone in there when it's sitting down in the kiln floor, mm. it's a bit too yeah, hot. hot. Okay, it's still so, hot. So the pots at the back are still hot. Okay, all right. Um, that's really, yeah, that's just really cool to know. And then we have one last question for now from um, Kashmira Patel, who I'm sure is asking a question that everybody is thinking of. Um, can I take part in this project next year? Um, and if you want to get involved, how should we get involved? <laughs> yeah, uh, you email can. List. Yeah, email list. Email me, do. It's, um, honestly, I get hundreds and hundreds of emails asking, can, mm. I, come on, can I come and participate? Yeah, yeah. And yeah, you can actually can. This is mm. part of Oxford University's, mm. it's my research. I'm yeah. an anthropologist. I'm studying making, craft making, mm -hmm. but I want people to participate. This is a real kiln. It survives because Joseph's a potter. He's not an anthropologist. He's not a, an academic. He's not here because I'm paying him to be here. He's here because these kilns... Learning. Well, because these kilns do something that you can't do in other ways. So it produces pots that you can, that you can sell, that you can exhibit, that, that, aren't, that you can't easily otherwise make. So, yeah, yes, come and so play. Beautiful. Email me a long time in advance. These firings take a while to set up, and a lot of people want to do it. Mm -hmm. um, what I really want to do is to set up what I'm doing is setting up mm. small groups who can yeah. fire the little kiln. Mm -hmm. And when we've got lots of little groups that yeah. work, yeah. we're going to put them together and yeah. we're going to fire this big kiln that's behind okay. us. All right. Um, and then, so how can people contact you? Or you can email me. And my email, I think, is, I'll put it on the website. I think it should be on the website. It is yeah. on the website. Okay, yeah. But if you look at us on um, Instagram, yeah. at Oxford University okay. Kilns. At Oxford University Kilns. Works. Okay. And if you look up me, Dr. Robin Wilson, mm -hmm. you'll find a lot of contacts mm. online. Email me, tell me why you'd like to, mm -hmm. to do it and your background. There's no qualifications mm. to, to participating other than an enthusiasm, mm. a willingness to live in tents, and mm. it's quite hard work. And hard work. Yeah, yes. it's hard work. We, we move all this wood around. It's, this is, I mean, the, the, the analogy I've been using is like volunteering for a steam railway. Mm. If you think okay. you're just going to drive the steam train, you're going to be mistaken. Mm. And disappointed. You know, you, and disappointed. <laughs> That's, driving the steam train is, is the really, really good bit, and you yeah. have to and there's a lot more to it than that. There's a lot of moving wood. There's a, there's a, lot, of, there's a lot of cooking. There's a lot of looking after mm. each other. I put the teams together here. We had a big team. I wanted the teams to look after each other. When they're firing, I want people putting a cup of tea in your hand, mm. you putting a cup of tea in their hands. We've done our, we do, our, we do the bathrooms, we do everything. Mm. Um, and, and so if you want to volunteer, yeah, certainly, but mm. it's distinctly not just sitting in front of a kiln quietly mm. chatting and putting the odd bit of wood in. It's a lot mm. of concentrate, you know. I do. <laughs> it's getting up. We fire around the clock. Yeah. It means being awake at four in the morning. It means seeing the dawn. Mm. It means being muddy and smoky and yeah. smelly. Um, it means concentrating. Only for three days, though. Mm. Yeah, only for three days. days. This well, one? Yeah, yeah, this one's a different yeah. question. This okay. is going to be... Although, saying that, it took five days to load it, four days to fire it, yeah. and another... You know, we've been on site for ten days. Yeah. So, so volunteering, it, it, it's a question of commitment. It's, okay. it's nice to do some pre-research. Mm. If you want to fire, think about 
what kind of pots go into this. Have a look at, at Japanese ceramics. Get a mm. feel for unglazed wood-fired ceramics and think, oh, is that something I want to be... Mm. Is that something I make? Is that something mm -hmm. I want to make? Is that mm. something that fits into my current practice? Mm. How will that develop my practice? Okay. And then just email me because okay, it's Wonderful. you know we're Thank building you. up teams all the time. Yeah. There are more and more okay. people all the yeah. time, and it's I mean, and this isn't going away. This mm -hmm. is something we're going to continue to do, um, and it's something we're going to continue to expand upon. Okay. Um, yeah. But as I think I was saying earlier, mm. I. I don't want people to just do this because it thing seems mm. like a, oh, I might try it. Mm, I kind mm. of like you to think about it and then mm. and think, actually, I really mm. want to try yeah, that. Yeah. I really want to benefit from that. Yeah. I really think that burning all mm. this wood is actually worth, worth doing. It. Mm. And it's worth doing if you learn something, yeah. put things in, produce yeah. things that are great, yeah. um, and really enjoy it. Mm. And I think the teams great. that have been here, I mean, this, this firing has been brilliant. Yeah. It was a team that came from all over the place yeah. okay, and cool. it worked really well didn't it yeah. fantastic um, team fantastic firing this time yeah and the work that comes great. out of a kiln that you fire like this mm. is so different from all other work there mm. okay. is a really lovely buzz over there i can hear it over my shoulder yeah um but yeah so thank you so working. much that's all we have for questions for now but please Brilliant. keep them coming in yeah if you've got um, any more questions then, ask and we'll try and yeah, try and, then, and answer yeah and then we'll probably uh see what's going on over there and then we'll come back later for more questions brilliant thanks so melody thank you no worries cool. thank you so much for answering me thank you bye for now Cool. Yeah. Well done. We actually don't, and I've got the record of all the maker's marks, so I'll, I'll try and dig it up after, but it might have been someone who visited directly to Robin, I guess. Yeah, I like that. It's all right. We saw big and it's going to be so right. Yeah. Final row. Back row. Come away. Left or right or right? Is that left or right, Rachel? Left. left. Yeah, left at the back. Oh, that's nice. Oh, that's that nice. Yeah. oh, this was slip cast, oh, that one. This is behind. Oh, this is so nice. This is behind that one. Okay, and then that's hiding that. behind that guy. Oh. So that's behind this. This is boring. Behind this group. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah. That's right. That's, really nice. that's your bowl. Oh, Who did that? Oh, Nessa. wow. Oh, wow. Nessa. So that's so nice. What? When we get you on, you've got to, you've got to bring yes, that video, you've got to bring that video to the camera. Yeah. This is on the far. <laughs> yeah. Who hasn't been in? Who hasn't been into on load? Come on. Who hasn't? Oh, I have. Melody, get in and unload. Front shot. Yeah, yeah, I've been in. Where's that come from? Front there. Come on, Melody, get in. Yeah. So I'm here with uh, Nessa from Sun Dragon. Hi, Nessa. How are Hello, you? Hello. I'm good. Thanks. Yes. Good? And we will be wrapping up at some point, um, possibly slightly after half two, because there's a couple of other things, other people we want to. Uh, show you but obviously the recording of this will be on YouTube afterwards so if you need to go by all means go but if you want to get a question in before you do um, do submit it one question actually was from a potter who was asking has my work come out Jose Carvalho Portuguese craft potter um, both of them have come out safely um, and the other ones are going to the next firing this one interestingly has some slip collected in Weymouth on it and it's you know it's very 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 glossy I would say mm, you know yeah. compared to some of the things we've seen coming out so that's some, yeah, you should be happy with those results, I think, Jose, if you've stayed with us this far. <laughs> um, but Nessa, what you're holding, yeah. I think, is a very special pot, yeah, um, which I'm is yours, super, isn't it? I'm super, super pleased with it. So I don't know if you can see, um, it's a Ashraf Hanna clay with a porcelain slip on the outside. Yeah. Yeah. And you've got these lovely pink shades, which I suppose is from the slip. Um, and this yeah, was so towards the back of the kiln, wasn't it? It was. I think like the second or third shelf down, maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and hmm. Yeah. I was really like, gorgeous. didn't know what I was expecting at all, really, because 
uh, I've never done anything like this before. And yeah. We were all kind of rounded up a little bit last minute. Um, so I just chucked four pots in. in. Yeah, yeah, whatever's <laughs> yeah. to hand. And yeah. you, of course, actually took part in the firing process as yes. well. How did you find yes. it? Yes, it was uh, really, really interesting. I was, I was trying to, I don't, I don't think I can think of anything else where you, um, you like have a collective, um, a collective process that mm. creates individual things. Um, yeah, I think that's really, quite right. yeah. really special, actually. Because mm. if it's collective, often the thing that you make is collective. collective. Mm. But without the collectivity, you mm. wouldn't get the individual pieces out. Yeah, so kind of all of our work has kind of contributed yeah. to the fact that your work has come out in the way it's come out. And actually, that's such an interesting angle. Yeah. I love, like yeah. that. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. it was quite hard work. I know you were on some of the really quite late yeah, shifts. Yeah, I did like at 12 o'clock till 5. Yeah. One. So this really is, yeah. you know, it's a, it's a round the clock process yeah. um, for quite a few days. Um, yeah. Sleeping not but really, that great. But... but really exciting to just be part of a like a sort of all absorbing mm. yeah yeah task really yeah yeah and tell me a little um, bit about sun dragon you know the about you know how the studio operates and what you guys are doing there because uh, it's really interesting yeah so it's a, a community pottery in birmingham um i've only really sort of come to it quite recently um and i've also got my own individual studio next door so i'm a sort of associate of it mm. um and uh becky it was, I think, Becky's baby. She, she made it. Mm. I don't know how many years ago. Maybe fifteen. It's about fifteen, something wasn't like it? That. It's been around for a while. Yeah. yeah. So it's sort of. Um, she wanted. She wanted sort of um, a studio which, which, was accessible to everyone. Mm. Um, so it's got a sliding scale of membership fees mm. according to what you can. Um, what you can pay, yeah, yeah, um, and then sort of collective responsibility for mm. for all of the jobs like the pugging and the yeah, firing the, the and stuff. Yeah, jobs, you know, because it's yeah. one of those things. It's, when yeah. you see this thing, you think, oh, pottery doesn't that look fun? But there is an awful lot of there's a lot, lot of, of grind, yeah, there isn't is a there? Lot of grind. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah, Becky does a lot of that work mm. as well. So you know, it's she, it's her dedication to yeah. allowing people to play and use clay sort of therapeutically almost yeah. as well. Yeah. I think. You know, it's a really healing process to make something, mm, and she's certainly. really dedicated a lot of time to to having that facility in Birmingham. Yeah, no, it's, it's use, such an interesting yeah. project, and so great that you guys are able to be involved. Yeah, and the fact that we get results like yes! this is just the cherry on the it's cake. Just so beautiful. Yeah, let's get that close to the camera. Have one last look at it. Give it a nice close up on that one. Oh, look, there we go. There, there we, we go. It's quite difficult to follow when we're looking at that screen. And but that is just it yeah. It's got some really beautiful sort of coral pink colour yeah, on the outside. Yeah, the, the pink is the flashing, and then the contrast yeah. on the inside with those really earthy yellows. Yeah. Um, is just yeah. That's yeah. a really really special piece. I like it so much. Yeah, I'm very very pleased. Great. Well, thanks so much for talking to us, Nessa. Mm, you're welcome. Thank you. Um, and we will be back very soon with Sharon. Um, and she'll talk a bit about her outreach work. And we also know we've got a question on the Torch YouTube channel, which we need to answer. So we're going to get a wood firing expert to come and answer that too. So see you guys very shortly.
Yeah, that's a good Okay, so we're back. I'm here with Sharon and Rua. We were on the same firing team together, so well done for surviving. <laughs> God, do you want to start telling us a little bit about the project, Sharon? Because yeah. I know it's super interesting. Oh, yeah. First of all, I'm going to say thank you, because I was a part, you made it, made it a really good team. And, um, and also thanks to Robin, who made it happen, and also Joseph, because of their dedication. Um, right, so about the project. Um, through the invitation, I was really pleased, because I... I'm doing my own particular work um, practice within the history and the ancestry of, of making pots mm. and making those links and then bringing it into my um, my teaching practice, yeah. I think. So, so everything's connected. I can't, it's not just one thing. Mm. So it's all enveloped around a, a quite a few things. It's, it's multi-layered or yeah, multifaceted. Yeah. So anyway, um, so this particular fit one is um, an Adinkra pot, a Ghanaian Adinkra symbols, um, making my connections to uh, West Africa, looking at a particular place of Ghana. Um, so, and because I come from a graphic design mm. background, because um, that's one of my practices, um, I. I like looking at the, the actual shape, the 2D flat shape, mm -hmm. which is quite symbols, and they all got different meanings. Yeah. So this is a Sankofa bird, um, and it means to go back, look back in order to oh, go forward. Wow. So it's like looking okay. back at your past, your history, in yeah. order to make go forward. Not neglecting it and not just staying there, but just... And not be, burying it either, yeah, not but, dwelling on it. Yeah, yeah but yeah. actually using that as a sense of not your knowledge and going oh, forward. Right. And so in terms of um, my own research in that, I like to share that with my students. Mm. Um, and in terms of knowledge of history, like global yeah. history, not, you know. So and where are your students, Sharon? Where do you teach? So um, I teach, well, first of all, I do an after school club in a primary school, which is um, Pickhurst Junior Academy. Um, and then I teach um, on a BA graphic design course mm -hmm. at Canberra College of Arts, yeah. U uh, University of Arts as well. Um, and so I also work with, so I work in two departments really within the UAR. So in the graphic design department, teaching, as I said, a BA course, and, and yeah. such as Rua, yeah. uh, one of the students, and I'll talk a bit, bit more about that as well. Um, and also work in um, Campbell, Chelsea, Wimbledon, also in the CCW, um, outreach. Um, so I work on various programs within outreach, um, and, and both are really close to my heart in terms mm. of what I do, nice. um, and I find it really Im immense in terms of the practice. So. Yeah, yeah. There's me linking in between the schools and the transition between primary school, secondary school, further education to higher education. That's why I involved the schools in this project. So the project is um, encompassed around, as I said, um, the histories, sharing that history. And interestingly, it happens to fall within October, which is Black History Month. But then I, I, it's, that, that, it's that kind of platform. But it also goes deeper than that in terms of not just in one month, but it's actually part of the curriculum access mm. in terms of learning in that whole platform of what we're talking about, decolonizing the curriculum. But yes. actually, it's about education, everybody's history, world history, global history, really, um, and getting that sense. So I invited the children in the Pottery After School Pottery Club because they share their stories, they share their narratives, and we, we, we embrace all of that. And it's their the sort of sense of freedom in terms of how they, they're approached to things. Mm. Um, and also then to, do, to invite the secondary school that I've worked in 
particular projects. Yep. And this, these students have previously worked in the summer with um, some biographic design students on a equality, diversity, inclusion program. Mm. And so it, it's a case of keeping those connections, keeping this sort of um, relationships going yeah. between um, BA graphic design students and also the, the, the at the time they were year nines, now they're year tens. Mm -hmm. So they're kind of looking ahead, their aspirations into art and design and also where they see themselves. So it's kind mm. of like inspiring each other and that kind of mentoring yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. So it's yeah, really no, getting yeah. them them to, to do the work mm. as well. So, so it started off with mine, but then I wanted to see what the students done. So, so do a little swap. There yeah, you go. Thank you. So, so these are the significant pieces. So they, 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 we, so we talked, spoke about, uh, you know, bits about ancestry. Um, yeah. We're looking at the fabric of Africa. So we literally looked at fabric, uh, African mm. fabric, um, Ghanaian fabric as well, Ta and tra tracing some of the, the prints, uh, tracing from the prints or drawing from the prints, yeah. and creating our own. And so this is like we start off two D because mm -hmm. again it's like graphic design, two D to three D. Um, like so, it's slab surface, like net shapes, what they're used to, and then they transferred their designs into the the. the the clay yeah. and so there are two different types of clay so I want to see what the results are so this is from the primary school using um, Scarver stoneware um, as well um, and this is it's just lovely in terms of what mm. the outcome and yeah, also the freedom yeah um, and what they did inside and out um, and so yeah this is the primary school so again from year three to six which is not yeah which is uh, age from the age of seven to eleven year olds that I have. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, so this is um, someone in year five, I believe. So they'd be like wow. year nine year nine year old. Yeah, nine year old. Year old. Yeah. And they're, they're producing work like that. Yeah. Um, and then this is from uh, year ten, um, and it's a, again it's that taken. They, so there's similarities in the both because they're mm. both looking at the same kind of fabrics but then putting their own impression on it, literally yeah. impression into, into the clay. Yeah. So this is the student work again in year 10 for their portfolio, which will... Okay. And then also it will give them, because they worked with directly with students from the BA graphic design course, so mm. they're working together. So whilst they were making theirs, um, BA students will, were also making theirs in the same space right. and sharing their own narratives and stories and, what, and also what their history meant and, and so on. So it's all that storytelling around yeah. conversation around the making yeah. so yeah so that's and what the results the and fantastic results. so then it leads me on to because the conversations because it's everything by chance having speaking to Rura um, and about her work and and also inviting um, five students from um, the BA course who are really interested in this and, and get them to produce their work as well so I'm gonna hand over to you because it's been really great yeah so um, I just got into pottery like in the past few months yeah. and it just so happened that Sharon, who was my tutor, is like also involved in that. So she basically gave me the opportunity to like come and experience um, the Japanese wood firing, which is like something that I've never experienced before. Mm. It was a really, really good experience. Like I think everyone, it's like really social, like mm. you spend so long just like putting wood and fire with people so like the conversation everything it was such a good experience so. yeah is it, yeah i think so yeah. and it was great to watch you um what you were doing and to talk about ideas of your work and how you're making things but also just the fact that it was the doing so yeah. it was getting in getting those gloves on exactly yeah um and how did that feel for you doing it, was it literally so exciting like it's so much fun yeah it really feels like you like open the door and it's fire and it's just like <laughs> <laughs> you know it's just not something that I've done before so mm -hmm. it's really exciting like definitely recommend um, like loads of people to experience this I don't think I don't feel like a lot of people do this so yeah yeah it is really like and I think you, you mentioned a key thing is about we're all together and it was community yeah exactly, there's a yeah. great sense of community definitely. and the fact that we yeah there's that dedication interest of you know, similar to be staying up all night, yeah. or working on it was teamwork. It, it was, was like harmony between yeah. everyone because while people were doing the like um wood firing, um the like there'll be other groups that are like cooking and like constantly asking do you want tea or coffee yeah. and like it was really caring, like bonding mm. experience I think. Yeah. Mm. Really lovely, yeah. Yeah, what do you think? Yeah, and I couldn't agree more, you know, mm. and I think I got lucky, you know, having you guys as company the whole time, you know. <laughs> yeah. We, yeah, we had, you know, we had a bit of fun as yeah. well as, you know, some serious concentration and, yeah, you know. Exactly, yeah. And I think we all learnt a lot. I mean, 
I don't think we're going to be firing it as just the three of us anytime soon. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it was, it was great, you yeah. know, I think we learned so much. And mm. I think to have a project such as what you're doing, mm. Sharon, as part of this, you know, it couldn't really be more important, you know. Mm. Um, when we're talking about the equalising yeah. area, that is it the space inside that yeah. kiln and the teamwork. So the fact that it's connected to your outreach activities, yeah. which you know are so far reaching, and you managed to bring in uh, students, I think you, yeah. you also deserve you know, some no, pretty serious credit for managing to do all yeah. that. Um, you know. Honestly, it's been awesome. I'm really humbly, sincerely grateful. And we've, we've been blessed with really good weather. Yeah, good company, yeah. Everything just, just fell into place. Yeah. And yes, it's hard work and everything else. And you know, you kind of get overtired to the point of being mm. slightly delirious. <laughs> yeah, just a little, yeah. <laughs> um, but around that, I mean, there's, there's lots of things that happen. As, as I said, everything seems to be quite layered yeah. um, around. Again, I learned a lot of different f things from different people, mm. different yeah. kind of stories, um, everybody's localities yeah. and how we've all come together in this one space to share. Yeah. Um, and I, that will always stick with me. And I'm, and I'm humbly grateful for Everybody who does has been organising it and being a part of that team, being a part of such a great team. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The best and, um, team. <laughs> oh no, that's on camera now. Be careful. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, and it's something that um, yeah, I'll, I'll never forget, and um, yeah. and I hold on to. Yeah, I certainly couldn't agree more. Yeah. And um, so can I just say, yeah, yeah, go and, on, and to further to share that, continue to share it with the students and and mm. continue to invite more students because it's it's a great experience, um, and just to be out in nature. Yeah, it's, it's a great experience. And the students' work will be featured as part of the exhibition yeah. as well. So it'll be a fantastic opportunity to have the students come, Absolutely. Yeah. see their yeah. work on display, yeah. and you know, and also tell that story about yeah. the project. So you yeah. know, once we actually have the exhibition up and running, then the, everything Sharon's working on will be part of the exhibition. Um, and it's it's really worth coming down to have a read and, and learn about that as well. You know. Yeah. Um, yeah thank you. Yeah. So that'd be great. Thank All right, guys. Thanks thank so much for coming to chat to me. Right. Yeah. Great. Cool. Yeah. I should crack on a bit. All right. <laughs> and we'll be back in a minute with our last interview before wrapping up. So All any right. final questions, do get them in. All see right. you in a minute. Thank you so much. Thank you. Graham. 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 You good? Last one. Have we got some questions? Um, so we have some questions here again, um, and 
Uh, one of the questions is, how does the firing create the shine in the glade? And I think we'll let Robin answer that one again. Yeah, sure. And and you've got another question. Oh, and there. another one from Michaela is, can we see Claude Assage's piece? Yes, you can. Yeah, Here I'm surprised. Is. That, is that from Claude? Bon après-midi, Claude. <laughs> Look at that. So this is, um, I think he calls it the portal of the sun. Is that right, Claude? Um, so this we put in the valley in between the two stacks of pots. And it has, Claude, I assure you, come out beautifully. It's really lovely. Um, but it's a very nice illustration of that shine. I don't know if you can see the, the light reflecting off it there. Um, so to answer that question, the glaze is glass. That's, it's, it's a full crystallization. So it shines because it's, a, because it's a fully crystalline product, just as glass is. That's why it shines. Um, and when it's not fully crystalline, you, you do get the, the matteness of it. But this, you see, it's, it's shining all over. It's beautiful, isn't it? So the clay body itself has fully recrystallized. This is stoneware, of course, rather than earthenware. So, so at 1300 degrees, or, or about cone 12, it's got to, it, the, the clay minerals in it fully recrystallize. So, um, so this is non-porous. This is, this is stoneware. Uh, these are crystals as they are with stone. And, and the glass itself, like that on that, you can see that, look at that beautiful sheen on it. It's really good. And so the way that the fire, like how does the fire like make it glossy and shiny? How does the fire make yeah, it glossy? Yeah. It, well, it's just the like heat. How, so, okay. so, so when you heat um, clay minerals up, mm. they recrystallize. Okay. Um, they, the, the clay minerals, which mm. initially contain um, water mm -hmm. in the in the in the in the structure of the mm -hmm. clay minerals. The water is driven off. Mm -hmm. The the clay minerals themselves mm -hmm. become mm -hmm. crystalline. And if you heated them further, mm -hmm. they would start to bloat mm -hmm. and crack and sag okay. and, and break right. down. And then yeah. if you went even further, mm -hmm. they'd become liquid. So okay. we've done clay experiments yeah. with earthenware clays, mm -hmm. and they just liquefy and okay. disappear. So basically, the shininess on this um, it's due to the clay heating up and then turning into glass. Yeah. Right? Well, it's yes. So, so that's that's just clay heating up and turning okay. on glass. Yeah. But the 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 glaze is really mm. is really the ash from the firing. Okay. So it's not actually glaze. No. It's well, just ash. well, glaze glaze is like glass. Mm -hmm. So where you put a glaze yeah. when you when you deliberately glaze a pot, yeah. you're putting something which recrystallizes on it. Okay. We haven't glazed these pots yeah. deliberately. Okay. But but the the process of firing itself mm. adds a material which. Mm -hmm. Which, which is from the ash, mm -hmm. from the firing. Mm -hmm. We heat that enough mm -hmm. and it becomes mm -hmm. an autoglaze. Mm -hmm. When these were fired initially in the, um, in the 1200s, you see, you see glazing on utilitarian pieces. And it, clearly was, it was clearly a side effect okay. of the firing. It wasn't a deliberate thing because the pieces were not art pieces yeah. being made um, in, in BZ. They, it was a side effect. It was a nice unintended side effect and it was the side effect that was then um, selected for by tea ceremony masters who, was, who were looking for vernacular Japanese pieces, particularly in the late 1500s, for, for, for their tea ceremony. So it's a side effect, but my word, it's a lovely side effect. Mm, absolutely. Um, and look, you can see this, I don't know if you can see that the front and back, you can see this side faced the blast of the flame and this side was protected from it. So you've got this, a lovely topography which again the Japanese would probably call yakashime. It's, mm. a, it's a very lovely piece. And, and this illustrates the, the, the razor sharp edge of this. You can see very clearly the distinction between front and back. And that's part of the joy of, of these pieces, whether they're functional teacups or whether they're art pieces like this. Mm. It's the things that your eye can explore. Does that help? Yeah, I hope that answers the question. That's a lovely uh, response. Um, and I think now we'll pass on to Callum um, with, I think, are there a few more questions left, but we can pass that on to Callum now. Are you guys wrapped up? Yeah. Okay, cool. So I'll get uh, Graham and then that's us done. Mm -hmm. okay. Cool, thank you, Melody. <laughs>
Josh, we'll toast you, Harry, when we get back. That's so kind of you. It's been so, so wonderful. We can't even say how So here we are back. Um, I appreciate we've overrun over the scheduled time, so thanks to everyone who stayed with us to the very end. Um, we will be putting a slightly abridged version of this on YouTube afterwards for those of you who couldn't, you know, join or couldn't stay. Um, so keep an eye out for that and share it with people who you think might be interested. Um, but before we wrap up, I would love to speak to Graham uh, to tell us a little bit about your involvement with the project. Um, so do you want to start just by introducing yourself? Yeah, my name's Graham Hughes. I'm an artist and a printmaker. I teach printmaking at the Ruskin School of Art, yep. the part of Oxford University. And so I got involved with the project through uh, chatting with Robin about how we could link up kind of the different sites of craft practice from the Ruskin School, which is a kind of contemporary fine art um, undergraduate and postgraduate course, and then this site of practice within the university mm. of um, working with ceramics and this traditional technique. Yeah. Um, and so that would be a pathway. So this put my involvement in the project, Robin and you guys kind of invited me to be part of it as a kind of pathway for maybe for our students to kind of yeah. Follow in that route um, and maybe use this process as part of their practice. Yeah, and um, a lot of the students came on the Thursday, didn't they, and actually saw the firing happening. And you know, it's a great experience to have if you've just joined the school and they're straight in the field seeing it going on and you know, connecting the dots between fine art and craft. I think you're really operating as that bridge, aren't you? you yeah, 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 we try, yeah, quite a few, a few uh, first years and third years came up, and yeah, it was really interesting, I think, for them to see a different aspect of, of making. See you later and then maybe how um, they could interweave mm. kind of working with clay and, and this site yeah. within their practice of fine art. So yeah, we're really, as you were saying, we're really trying to join up the, the dots effectively between fine art and the discussion between anthropology and archeology, span which this does very well. Yeah, so, it's existing on that border, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. and I think those um, interdisciplinary discussions are really important and kind of cross uh, collaborative making. Mm. Really important. And what did so, you produce? Because I think these. So I've, yeah, I'm, really, I'm really yeah. pleased with this. So this is um, uh, this is part going to be part of a sculpture. So I'm using this as kind of like an experimental process. Yeah. Um, I've been working with the Natural History Museum and uh, in Oxford, uh, and so they've excavated uh, two plane trees to make way for the development of a new science college. Right. So they wanted an artist to kind of work with the trees, so they didn't go to waste effectively. Mm -hmm. So I've been working on making some sculptural pieces, yeah. but also some engraving blocks, so wood engraving blocks. Yeah. And then also part of this project during the firing, I put in a block, mm. um, it's kind of like a bit of a ritualistic offering and part of my heritage, kind of in my ancestors were brick makers. So mm. I'm kind of doing some work that's to do with crosses to do with my craft heritage and yeah. how it, that then translates through this project. So hopefully some, I mean, symbolically some of the ash would have ended mm. up onto on some, some of the ceramics as yeah. well, so that would be part of a, the future sculpture piece as well. So yeah, and I think really that was a beautiful moment when we sort of gathered around the kiln and we, yeah. and we put the piece in, you know, I think you could feel the symbolism of the, of the action, you yeah. know, and the fact that it traces all the way back to the Natural History Museum as well. It's just such an interesting way to have an artistic mm. angle mm. on that wood that otherwise would have gone to waste, as yeah. you say. Yeah. yeah, oh, thanks, yeah. yeah. No, it was quite a kind of, I think it was late at night, so it was quite a kind of emotional moment. <laughs> yeah, for yeah, me. we'd all been for tired for how many quite, hours. Yeah, so what is this suddenly, yeah. To, yeah, no, it's, such a, it's been such a great process to go yeah. through. I think, like, the collective kind of effort, um, mm. everyone coming together, discussions that have come out of it, friendships that have come out of it have been yeah. really special. So yeah. it's, um, couldn't agree more. Yeah, it's kind of like a very unique project, so, mm. yeah. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Great. Well, I think we'd better wrap up at some point. Um, so all's left to say um, from the Embassy of Japan, uh, thank you to the Oxford Research Centre in the Humanities um, who have been putting this on alongside us as part of their Japan season. 
um, which do check out the Torch website. There's lots of other interesting Japan-related events happening. Um, and also the Japan UK season of culture is still going to the end of this year. So there's an awful lot of exciting Japanese related events, cultural events and otherwise, all across the country. Um, so that's very much worth checking out. And last but not least to Dr. Robin Wilson and the whole team uh, at the Oxford University Kilns. Um, it was sort of those three organisations who, who got the project rolling. Um, but getting it rolling is only one side. The rest is Graham, the rest is everyone who helped. Um, a few people I've spoken to today, but that was not everyone. Um, it's been a huge team, it's been good fun, um, and it really couldn't have happened without them. So I think we've all been thrilled. Um, and the exhibition is due to begin in the middle of December. So do stop by the Embassy of Japan if you're around um, and come and see the pots in real life. Because you know, how they look in real life is actually very different from how it looks when we're holding it up to the camera. This really is just a first glimpse. Um, so yes, look after yourselves um, and hope to see you in the winter time. Thank you for joining today. Bye bye.